good afternoon. My name is Patricia Trujillo, and I am so honored to be sitting in the ABQ Cultural Center and Library uh, to bring this panel to you all. Um, if we all look a little red in the cheek, it's because we spent a wonderful morning up at the Morada uh, watching the Inditas um, hold and perform a sacred ceremony uh, that you will all be watching in a separate video. But today we have the great honor to be sitting with the Trujillo family here from the Pueblo de Abiquiu uh, to hear from them and to hear about their family's traditions and their connections to the Inditas of Abiquiu. And so I want to start by introducing everybody. Uh, Across the table, we have Dexter Trujillo, uh, who is the lead drummer for the group. Um, then we have uh, Chavela Trujillo, uh, who is one of the uh, young women in, in the Pueblo who has taken um, to being a teacher of the younger girls um, uh, in passing on the tradition to the younger generations. Uh, next to her, we have her father, uh, Virgil Trujillo, who is also one of the elders and, and um, uh, I would say ceremonial leaders of the Inditas um, and a lot of the different ceremonies here in the Pueblo. And then right to next to me, I have Delilah Trujillo, uh, who is also one of the teachers of the young women in the Pueblo. And so thank you so much, first and foremost, for inviting us into your Pueblo, into your homes, and also into your um, traditions. Uh, this is all part of a bigger conversation uh, with the Smithsonian Symposium. Um, that is called the other slavery and so we know that the pueblo of abiquiu is such an important part of that history so if we could start there could you please um, um dexter and virgil but also chavela and delilah could you tell us a little bit about the history of the pueblo the abiquiu and your own family's history here in particular how it connects to um uh being a henny saddle well i'll start by um I guess starting by by what I've heard within my my own family and not only my family but people around me here in Abiquiu and the surrounding areas uh, mostly our family um, that's not to say that a lot of people uh, that that are from here aren't our family we consider everyone our family uh, even in other other towns but uh, the first thing I remember hearing Napicu hearing about the Indians was really not even hearing or doing anything just walking outside and maybe finding a piece of pottery um, narrowhead flint and you know we I wondered well you know there has to be people here that were here before us and then as we grow up, we, we see the different, uh, I guess, fiestas that come, come through uh, our church here in Abiquiu, Catholicism. And, uh, you know, they're all entwined. I used to ask my grandparents, uh, Benjamin and Susana, our chuleta, when I grew up, they raised me. Uh, and I would ask him, you know, why, why is it that we celebrate La Fiesta de Santo Tomás el Apóstol aquí en Abiquiu? Y ellos me decían que porque aquí era pueblo de los indios, aquí era el pueblo de los genízaros. Y para mí la palabra genízaro es uh, pueblo indio con sangre de español. Uh, y puede ser los yutes. Comanches, Tehuan, Navajo, uh, diferentes Comanches, uh, de todo tipo de, de gente de India, pero también me acuerdo que decían que la gente de ABQ, um, I'm going to do English and Spanish, uh, eran outcasts, mm. y aquí en ABQ vinían a dar los que hacían mal seguro que en otros pueblos pero abiquiu siempre era a starting point abiquiu siempre les daba la confianza de hacer mejor en su vida si ellos querían voltear su vida podían venir en abiquiu y los aceptaban por eso hay gente aquí en abiquiu que es de todo tipo 
porque aquí comenzaban la vida de nuevo uh, y, y mucha <coughs> gente, uh, you know, el modo de, de empezar was to really make peace with la gente india, with the Indian people and the Spanish people. Uh, and one of the ways was really by, by dancing. You've probably heard of the matachines. You know, we used to have the matachines that was performed here in Apicue. I never saw it. We tried to, to revive it, but um, I don't know, every time we tried, like several times, and you know, people, you know, the first two times of practice were into it, and then it just dissolved. So, you know, it saddens me and my heart that we were never able to get that going, you know, because we were left with a lot of the costumes and, and artifacts that belonged to that dance. And you know, that was a dance, a strong dance here in Abiquiu during the Christmas season. Mm. What we have today, and we haven't let that go, is really the Nanie, and maybe because we push harder, and it's really celebrated the weekend of Thanksgiving, and that hasn't changed for since I was little, since I can remember, I'm 60 years old, and as I, as long as I can remember, El Nanie has been danced forever. Uh, and it's always, like like uh, Virgil said, it's always been the two little girls. That's not to say that uh, in elder times, even before that, my grandpa used to say that it was the elders. And my grandfather, Benjamin, died at 98, and he used to say that they never had little kids dancing, that it was always la gente mayor, you know, that it was the, the elders that danced. And then I don't know if what happened to the elders, but anyway, um, to this day, it's really that we're trying to, to teach the kids, the ones that want to learn, because really, if you want to learn, we accept you. It's part of our heritage, and you know, we're proud that we have it. Um, and then I consider it too, not as, as slaverism, but uh, we do have a, a dance uh, that if you're not from Abiquiu, you know, we dance either the Coyote or the Redondo. Rondo wasn't performed today, but you know, during that dance at the end, if you're not from here, here, they'll get you, they'll dance you, and they'll dump you up and down, and then they yell to the people, ¿Quién conoce a este? ¿Quién los conoce? We'll take him a captive, we'll, we'll take him captive, then nobody knows him, and then finally someone will come forward, and they'll give the, uh, you know, money or whatever it is that they have in return for the ransom and um, you know it's it you put two and two together and you get some some type of a outcome why like that dance is still performed today and I go maybe it's just the glory and the honor of, of you know we're, we're not uh, we're actually asking St. Thomas the Apostle to intercede for us to the Mighty One, God. And, uh, you know, and it's through our prayers, because I see our songs, our dances as really a sacred prayer. You know, because uh, Mano Elfino Garcia would always tell me, he was one of the drummers here in Abiquiu, uh, you know, that. In his day, bailan el baile el cemiterio y las mujeres en un lado y los hombres del otro. Y eran dos filas y, y empezaban y se juntaban y al último hacían la señal de la cruz. Los hombres en un lado y otros en el medio apuntando a la Santa Cruz. Y ese baile era para pa los difuntos para los que han, se han muerto, para los nuestros antepasados. And, uh, you know, I feel that one, and not only that one, but it's the Nanietum is really a sacred uh, dance because it's two little girls that dance, you know, they go in, in front of a statue, you know, it's to respect that something's big gonna happen, that we're here to 
honor and to give thanks for everything that we have because it's really through what we believe and our practices that you know that it's to me it's really a miracle that you know that we're still going today um, you know because a lot of things have died off but uh, you know the 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 dances in Nanie, like I said, you know, our slavery dance where we get people together and not only we welcome him that way. Well, thank you. But if I can bring Virgil into the conversation yeah, so, yeah. about, um, you said that Abiquiu is always this place that was uh, La Vida de Nueva, right? That everybody who came here was welcome to create a, a new homeland because so many of the people of the indigenous people who came to Abiquiu had been displaced, right, historically. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Virgil? <clears throat> yeah, I can try. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to go back and refer to things like as, as day one, meaning a beginning of something, okay? So the current Abiquiu that we have today, which is a Henisaro community, um, is the one is one thing, and I'll define Henisaro in a second. But we also uh, are mindful that the Henisaro community is also imposed on top of the ancient pueblo of Abiquiu. Okay, so when Dexter talks about pointing pottery and stuff like that, uh, th there were there was human activity and there was a pueblo here in Abiquiu, as are many along the Rio Chama, uh, way before Henisaros came to be. Now the word Henisaro, the word Henisaro, um, uh, of course, is a, is a Spanish word, but it has pre-Roman roots. And the practice, as I do, will define it in a second, is uh, the practice of Henisaro uh, is as old as mankind, okay? And many definitions have come about um, of the word Henisaro as it's been used through history. An all appropriate example, if you look into a really old dictionary and you look for the word uh, in English, it's going to be Janissary, and it's going to tell you something like Turkish troop, and it's going to take you back to, um, you know, Christians in the Ottoman Empire, and how a lot of those were captured in war and used as soldiers, okay? And that's legitimate. And then if you come to Abiquiu, real fast forward, um, uh, or to New Mexico, you're going to see the definition as Hispanicized uh, Indian. Okay, well, that's appropriate too. And now, now I'm going to go back and see how we come to that definition. As uh, you know, uh, back when our areas were being settled, everything was very labor intensive. Okay, and I already mentioned the practice of slavery. Uh, has been around as man as as long as man has been around, okay. And um, now the Catholic Church had actually outlawed outright slavery, but then it went and created other opportunities for settlers to use, uh, like native labor, and we have the encomienda system, and in this case we also we have the genisaro. Okay, so we're going to get to that. Uh, who is the Genisaro on day one? On day one, uh, the Genisaro, at least as it pertains to New Mexico, and this, this greatest definition, I felt was probably the first one I had encountered. That could change, you know, as, as we go on. But we had some visitors in Abiquiu one time, and I approached them because I saw them out here visiting, well, filming... Um, um, Bless me, ah. bless me yeah, bless me Ultima at the time. And the, the, the couple told me they were from Spain. Oh, I told the gentleman, I've been waiting for you for a long time. <laughs> of course, he takes a step back and, well, you know, what's this about? And what I was right away thinking is, here's someone that hasn't been influenced. If he's a visiting from Spain, probably hasn't had too much of a chance to be influenced about the word Henisaro. Because actually the word Henisaro was even new to me. 
okay? I didn't grow up hearing about a lot about Genisano, okay? And then all of a sudden I heard the word and I'm like, okay, what's this all about? So I investigate and, and of course I dedicate a, a major part of my life to studying that. But as a Spanish gentleman, I have a word in Spanish that I'd like to know if you can tell me the meaning. And, and he said, what is it? And I said, the word is genisaro. And like that, he told me, captive children of war. And it was right on the money. Mm. It was right on the money. Because see, the genisaro originally, um, okay, so while the Spanish are basically at war with nomadic tribes, um, that's what sets forth the captive children of war. Uh, we're getting along with the Pueblos, but there's technically a war going with nomadic tribes, okay? And so children are, 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 are um, booty or, 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 or chattel of war, okay? And you know, they're using them as well. And then the need for all this labor uh, by new colonists uh, is also there. So at many of these trade fairs, which, which already existed actually prior to European onset, we, we, we know the Pueblos were already trading with the nomadics and so on. So some of that was probably going on. I mean, like I said, the practice is as old as man himself. And okay, so then uh, we start seeing the marketing of children, uh, younger children, women, uh, young adult boys, m mainly, mainly, okay? So you go to the Spanish, I mean, you go to the trade fairs, whether it's the one in Abiquiu, Taos, or some places that had a better reputation, so on and so forth, and you can actually trade horses, knives, anything that we have, things that are made of metal, okay, with nomadic tribes, you know, for, for buckskins, for dried meat, for whatever's coming off of the areas where they live. And we're trading, you, you know, whatever we're producing on this end. But there are the children and there are the genisaros, okay? And uh, they're being traded as well, okay? Um, now, the the Spanish government approaches it this way or allows it to happen this way um, we're actually going to pay a ransom okay Th these are kind of like the conditions you're actually going to pay a ransom for the genisero children well that sounds kind of nice you know so but you go and you, then you're going to be freed at adulthood okay well so that's kind of nice you're not going to be in slavery all your life right wrong <laughs> well, for a lot of time, it's wrong, because in the beginning, see, once you reach adulthood, and you're the genisero, and now you can be freed, and you're going to become a citizen. That's the coolest part, too. We couldn't even do that in this country till day before yesterday. Okay, so, but you know what? The genisero can't buy a, 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 a bus ticket back to the plains, wherever he was taken from, so sometimes he ends up living in the same household forever. Now, there were very strict rules about how you treated Genisaros and, and folks at home. You have to treat them like family too. You know, this isn't just a slavery where you beat them all day long like we get these ideas about, you know, what was happening in this country. So actually many became part of the family. They even intermarried and so on and so forth. But as time went on, and the Genisaro uh, realized that he was a citizen. He could now start to act like a citizen. He could ask for land. He had freedom. Okay. So let's say um, 1744, 1754 roll around and enough Genisaros are asking the Spanish government for land. You know, they want their own communities. Okay. So the, and, at, and the Spanish Governor Tomas Valles Cachupín at the time is challenged with the fact that the nomadics are raiding the Spanish colonies. Okay, so he comes up with the idea to create Genisaro settlements. Okay, and he's gonna well we don't we don't say the the 
the, the term, kill two birds with one stone anymore, boy, that'll get you in the wrong place real quick this day and age. But maybe we saved the, uh, a bird with two corns. But what ended up happening is that he creates the Genisano, Genisano settlements to protect the Spanish uh, colonies. And he has that challenge. So he puts two and two together. So our ancestors that are the Genisaros, freed Genisaros, which are now uh, Spanish citizens, uh, acquire land. This is their land. This land is put together under all those Spanish rules that have to do with indigenous people. Four Indian leagues, it was a minimum for each Native American community. From there it could grow depending on population, but that was the minimum, okay? And uh, we know that some attempts to create the, fir the first settlements in Abiquiu are 1754 because, I mean 1744, because we have um, documentation that, that, that tells us that. But the real official recognition of Abiquiu as a Genisado settlement, which is all written in this really nice document which we were trying to get a hold of uh, today, the original is, is in Santa Fe, is May 10, 1754. That's kind of the official birthday of Abbey Q, so to speak. And uh, there it spells out what happened. You know, the, 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 who, who's ever the, the person in charge, probably Alcalde Mayor, uh, on behalf of the governor, comes out to Abbey Q. And it says that from the center of, the pl of, of Abbey Q, uh, which, you know, I still, a lot of questions I have. How do, how do we determine which is the center of Abbey Q if we're out here for the first time? I don't think we're out here for the first time. But we measure uh, 2.500 varas, pal norte, pal sur, pal oriente, y pal poniente. Okay, e north, east, west, south. We measure uh, 2,500 varas. So those are varas castianas. That's a Spanish measurement that's real close to a yard. Okay. And we assuming that they stood out here in the Pueblo, where that was the center, and that measurement was taken. That's the first two Indian leagues. That land will be used for building your homes, for building your gardens, and so and those kind of things. Okay. Then a second um, part is added to, to the first, and they, that one is measured five thousand square. Of course, you know. The same as the first one, and that's added directly to the south. And that will become our ejido. That will become common land, still privately owned by Abiquiu, but it will be common use of that land. That land is where you'll take your, your goats, whatever, to graze, your sheep, your cattle. That's where you'll go for firewood. That's where you'll you, you know, go for uh, building materials, things of that nature. And um, that will be common land for the use of the whole community. Okay? And anyway, that's some of how ABIQ begins. And then that's how, how we sometimes define the Genisaro. Okay? Now, I might mention, uh, I mean, we could go on and on, but I may mention at the time, there's almost like two ABIQs going on at the same time. Because we have that challenge. Now anybody that hears that their family was from Abiquiu, they assume they're from the Pueblo. But a lot of times they're not. See, you had the Genisero community was the one Abiquiu. That's really the real Abiquiu. But then the whole jurisdiction, what we might call now the whole uh, zip code area was called the Abiquiu because there was no other name. Okay, so a lot of the Spanish colonies that are along the river are also ABQ. So we have lots of people that are from the ABQ, but they're Spanish. Okay, so, so that, you know, it's kind of tough, you know, you have to break sometimes the sad news to many people, you know, that maybe that's where it was happening. But we also know, and this is a really cool tidbit, that the Pueblo of ABQ, or the area of ABQ, is the most written about and documented area in New Mexico history. That's incredible. And of course, back in the day, there were three main areas in, in northern New Mexico, in the, in, the, in the Rio Arriba area. And one of them, of course, was Abiquiu, because it's the furthest point, uh, you know, to the northwest. Um, the other one was Santa Cruz de la Cañada. 
and then what was the third one holy moly um, I'm trying to think maybe Albuquerque were the three main hubs the three main hubs back then okay so so Abiquiu was really important back then I mean it, it also later on in history becomes a takeoff point uh, of the old Spanish trail to Los Angeles okay so I'm gonna go back and if I could jump in and um, get some perspectives from your daughters because as you're hearing this history mm -hmm. right you know this this is you this is where you come from and I am wondering you know uh, that your dad said he did not grow up hearing the word Genisaro but did you grow up hearing it and what does it mean for you all to carry this culture forward or this history forward so the word Genisaro um, mm -hmm. I didn't hear it much as a when I was much younger. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely started hearing it more, I'd say around uh, teenagehood. Mm -hmm. That's when a lot more um, oh, history is. leaders were coming to study and wanted to know more and writing books and things like that. And that's where that word started uh, to grow. Um, when I was younger, we are just called the Inditas, the Abiquiu. Mm -hmm. so that's what I grew up with more. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And how about you? I, I agree with that. I mean, I'm eight years younger than Delilah. And so um, growing up, I did hear the term Genisaro a lot. But at that point, um, that was who I was. And that was my background. And I always grew up knowing that we, we danced for the Pueblo de Abiquiu. And I was an Indita. Mm -hmm. And like Dexter points out also, it wasn't... Um, a big realization or a huge um, kind of bombshell being dropped because we go outside and we see the artifacts and we see our community and our native and Spaniard history every single day since day one growing up here. Mm -hmm. And to also just bring in the whole family into conversation is like this idea of how your family has been so critical in maintaining the dance traditions, right? Like moving away from that word preservation and just this is something that's part of the lifeblood of the community. Um, as you were speaking, Dexter, you mentioned how uh, like the tradition of the dance has just always been here. And one of my favorite definitions of space um, is by a cultural geographer named Doreen Massey. And she says that the definition of any space, right, like Abiquiu, is the simultaneity of stories told so far in that space and that you keep layering and so how do you see the dance as being part of that storytelling in Abiquiu? And I would love to hear a little bit from everybody okay. on that. I'll brief on it. Um, I guess, I don't know, I, when, when I was growing up, I mean, we were blessed. I mean, that my mother uh, was raised by, by really her aunt. You know, the, the families were so big and um, you know, my grand, my real grandmother in Canyones, Severiana Salazar, actually shared uh, my mom with my aunt from Abiquiu. She was from Barranco, and uh, being that my my uh, grandma here in Abiquiu only had one daughter, and she died the same day, mm. born in the morning and died in the evening. You know, my grandma Salazar, Severiana. I guess apparently she just gave my mom to to my grandma here in Abiquiu, Susana and Ramon Suazo. Anyway, they raised my mom, but you know, my mom always, you know, she would get mad at us because she would say, you're not Indian and don't say you're Indian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it was because, you know, the way uh, people were treated, um, you know, there was a lot of prejudice. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Indian people really looked down on. And I have a feeling that's why really ABQ uh, never got uh, the recognition, you know, as being, uh, becoming the full, I guess, Pueblo Indian, you know, that the, like the federal government gave because, uh, you know, it was really the, the, illiterate people that didn't know how to write and that were Indian and were less fortunate, they didn't, weren't educated and they didn't get to sign or see papers or talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. It was really the rich people in Abiquiu that controlled like 
let's say the church, the governments. We know mm -hmm. for a fact there's a few stories that, mm -hmm. you know, um, the rich people did to the lower, to the poor people of APQ. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, but besides all that, you know, we, in these stories or these dances that we do, we can actually feel like the spirits of our grandmothers, our grandparents. You know, we see pictures. We, we've seen pictures here, you know, of our, our great grandparents. And not, not only have we seen their, our, uh, their photographs, but we've actually, like in the Moradas, La Fraternidad Piadosa, the Nuestro Padre Jesus, which is a fraternity, more or less like the third order of St. Francis of Assisi. We actually read their names in those old cuadernos that we have. So it's really a blessing. But going back to the, to the dancing, you know, we can actually say, you know, our grandmothers and our grandfathers at some time in their, in their day, they must have seen or they had a, a, some kind of a, a dream because why do we today do what we do mm -hmm. if it wasn't through there that they were that strong on maintaining and to tell us all those stories that they told us because I mean here in Abiquiu, uh my grandma Belen Trujillo would always tell us you know we're an Indian people and we're Navajoses and uh, you know the day of Santa Clara, which is August the 12th, you know automatically she would be dancing in her kitchen and she would say, Mijito, hoy es la fiesta Santa Clara, and she would sing, hey, ay, 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 ay. And I mean full of energy and you could just feel, feel the vibes. Mm -hmm. And we'll go to Chabela. Yeah, I think, I think that's a lot of what contributes to our dances staying and continuing is um, is the feeling. Uh, you do feel a sense of connection and definitely looking back at all the pictures and hearing the histories from our elders and all the uh, past Lenditas that have dr uh, danced, as well as the drummers. Um, you feel in a way like you're paying your respects, but it's also a connection, you know? Uh, we like to joke that if the drum isn't going, we have no rhythm. But <laughs> once it starts, we know the dances. And it's the sense of the connection and the respect. And I feel um, in every single culture, um, you have a sense of pride uh, for your ancestors and where you came from and your background. And in ABQ, we take pride in the fact that we at least know our ancestry and our, our uh, you know our lineage so yes we are spanish and yes we are native but we we respect that and so um we have a sense of pride in that so we continue it and i feel like our girls who continue the dances to this day also they may be young but they do respect that and they feel a connection mm -hmm. um to abiquiu Any thoughts on? Well, yeah, the, your your question. How how do the, the dances? You know, how how do we layer it on? How uh, anyway? So when I think about going back, because folk people have asked me the question of, about Henisaro and that, and, and of course, this is how we grow up. This is who you are. We did not know there was a difference. We I knew that that no one danced in other communities around us that are, that are Spanish. They didn't dance in Cañones. They didn't dance in Coyote. They don't dance in Medanales. <laughs> Nowhere else. The only place we dance is in Abico. I knew that right away. Did I question it? No, because that's the way. That, that's how I grew up. Okay. So we're gonna asking a little bit about like what sets us apart. Okay, as humans, we all have the same need. We all eat, sleep, and whatever it is that we do. That okay. So, but what makes us a little bit different? Okay. So, so the dances every year is what makes us different because that's actually our was our connection to our native roots okay so we're fortunate we grew up with our grandparents we have a nice big extended family but only in Abiquiu do we can we ask my grandpa or can he relate to us that he went to Indian school 
Oh wow, that's really cool. Indian school. Okay, so all of a sudden there's an Indian school. That's a little different. I thought we all went to the parochial school or, or wherever you go to school. But then he goes on and elaborates. And then and then we can ask him all the questions. Okay, because our Anisada roots is through my fa is through my father's side of the family, but our grandfather who raised us is also uh, Ahenisaro, and he's, they're also related. They're also Trujillos, okay? But then we're fortunate because, okay, we take interest in our parents. We're still not so advanced, and we're still not sucked up by this individualistic society, which I call now, which we're all on our own, or, or we don't care about our parents, we don't care about our grandparents, and we all move to a different part of the country. Yeah, I know sometimes we have to do that through work, whatever. Okay, but we don't. Okay, we could stay here another 300 years, but we'll be just fine. <laughs> okay, or at least that's how I feel. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of how I feel. That, that's what happened to us, no? Uh -huh. And so when I take the initiative, oh, boy, wow, there's really something here. Okay, we start to study all that. So now history starting to pick up on the Genisaro. Now finally the Native American, his best place isn't in the grave. It's actually okay, you know, to be Native American because, you know, my whole history, I learned how bad Indians are, okay? Any movie you watch, who's, who's always taking out the Indians, the cowboys always taking out the Indians. That's how we're being taught our history. And that's really sad. Because at the end of the day, we're all people. We're all people made by the same hand. But that's not what we learn in real life. Okay, so going back to the Genisaro, when we talk about Hispanicized uh, Indian. Now, now I know this gets us a little bit away from what we're talking, but the connection that I wanted to make for sure is uh, our Genisaro roots. And then as I go back and I start to take off the layers, we also see that the American government, President Taft, even recognized the Genisaro on the document we see right back here, where they require patents to be given to all lands after, you know, the, the United States or, or the Southwest is ceded from Mexico to the United States. The United States government takes on the initiative to try to give back all the land which they fail miserably to the people that actually own it. Okay, but it's my opinion, this is what I just say, for Abiquiu itself, while at the Court of Private Land Claims, all the um, um, testimony was negative, which that's normal. It was all negative uh, to Abiquiu. But someone in the last comment says, but the people continue to live there, have continued to live there since 1754, uh, when it was granted to him by the Spanish government and the Genesero community was created. That's when I say the heavens opened and the angel sang for a split second and the, someone, you know, power of be President Taft signed our patent and the heavens closed. And that's it. Okay, that quick. So we're really fortunate that um, well, miracle in progress is what we are, that, that it was recognized. Okay, so now we have our lands. So we, we had our lands. That's our other connection on the lair. Not only the dancing, but, but uh, the land. That's our home. How many were displaced because they didn't, their homes weren't given to them? Okay. Now, as we research that a little bit, we find out the Genisaro word in the old Spanish documents. It's right there. And then that's where it takes off. And then we want to learn more and more and more. So today, uh, because more and people want to learn about the Genisaro, uh, we're really learning a lot. And fortunately, a lot has been written about ABQ. So that's one of the other pieces that, that connects us to the land. Our neighbors, our family, how we celebrate at our church. Okay, so someone, because the Genisaro is so misunderstood, we've tried to be... I don't want to call it pigeonhole, but you try to be labeled as Pueblo. Well, maybe not Pueblo. As nomadic. Well, maybe not as Navajo, as, 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 as Kiowa, as somebody else. That's not who the Genisaro is. The Genisaro is, an, uh, um, is all of them. All of them because we don't know who was brought to Abiquiu exactly. Actually, we do know some because when my grandfather went to Indian school, they actually had to uh, fill out forms 
or applications and prove their quantum at the time, okay, to get into Indian school. So our good friend Gregorio Gonzalez, who takes a real interest in our history, um, decides to get his doctorate uh, on the subject, but he uses educate the educational system in northern New Mexico to get there. Because I had told him the last time I talked to Indian school, because I'm trying to research, you know what I'm really trying to find? I'm trying to find photos. You know how sometimes at school everybody takes a picture and so on and so forth. I thought, well, maybe that, you know, how cool would it be? We don't find a photograph, you know, from Indian school, which is a, you know, there's a real professional deal, you know, Indian school. And they may have something. So I call them. They've told me that all those documents have been sent to Denver. They give me the name. I'm not paying too much attention to it. Okay, so it's a, all this stuff's in Denver. I tell Gregorio that. And boy, when he starts to research, he found everything in Abiquiu. Every single person that had an application and what their quantum was as well. Not that that was even so critical to me because we're a people before we're a blood, before we're anything, okay? We just have an interesting culture. Because I didn't want divisions. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, you don't have enough Indian blood. You go that way. You don't have enough of this. You go that way. No. First of all, we're a people. We have a culture. And that's who we are. And that's enough. Beautifully stated. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, if I can give you the last word. <laughs> so I'll go back um, to storytelling with our dances. and. Um, our, our dances tell a lot of stories of our history. Um, our dances are brought in through our ancestors and even though they may have been taken as children or traded as children and given to a Spanish home or um, such and such, when they were, were released and they come back to Abiquiu, they remembered their dances, they remembered what they did, they showed the rest of the Pueblo and. Um, our dances may be a little different from other Pueblos. We dress a little different from other Pueblos. We have some things that are similar to some Pueblos as well because each of these ancestors brought in a piece of their own history mm -hmm. and we merged it all together. Mm -hmm. um, the best part of the storytelling from the dances is when you're dancing and the younger girls start asking, you know, um, what is this dance? Why do we dance? What, um, we have, you know, dollar bills pinned at one point in our dance and they want to know why. And that opens up the door to tell them a little bit about their ancestors, a little bit about their own family history, a little bit about um, being captives, being set free. Um, when Dexter talks about the redondo and we bring in outsider and we dance around them and quien lo conoce who do you know we pay ransom to set them free and they become part of the pueblo and that tells a story of our ancestry and you know how how we did come from different places and we were set free and we did come together to create a new community mm -hmm. beautifully stated and i just want to add that as dexter and i were driving over here you know, I was making connections also to like the other communities and growing up with our ceremonies, like our everyday ceremonies, weddings, funerals, and how I grew up my whole life going to weddings where they would do the ransom of the bride, right? They would take the bride away and everybody has to pitch in money. And the money, of course, is for the family then, I mean, for the young family to go on and start their lives. But I always wondered where did that tradition come from, right? And so, you know, we can't say for certain that, that it's definitely connected, but there does seem to be these connections that just spread throughout uh, northern New Mexico. And so I thank you all so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us about this. We know that we could keep on going. Yeah, but um, uh, just thank you so much for opening your Pueblo, for sharing your dances, and for having this conversation with us.